Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How lovely to see you on this freezing cold war morning. You're warming my heart just looking at your gorgeous faces. If you want to move forward and grab a seat. Welcome. Welcome to those of you in the building and welcome to those of you online. It's lovely to see you all here at St. Mary's. Hello, sweetheart. Well, today is the first Sunday of Advent. I, I, did, I actually thought that um, Advent started in December, but apparently not. What is it? The f first four weeks, four Sundays before Christmas. So um, this, the first week of Advent signifies hope. And times like this, where it seems um, that there's a lot of lack of hope, we read the news, I read the news quite a lot this week, as I'm sure everyone did, and I just kept feeling slightly um, full of despair and um, overwhelmed. But the difference between the hope of the world and the hope that we have is the hope of Christ. Christ is the hope for the world, and this is a hope that surpasses just optimism and seeing the bright side of things but it is Christ is the hope of nations the hope of the world and this is the promise as we look towards um, as we look towards Christmas we look towards in anticipation of the hope of the nations Christ Jesus our Lord and so I'm going to be um, to, uh, to have a little bit of nepotism here and ask my daughter to come up and light the first advent candle. Come on, Sophia. You want to just use this? It makes it easier, doesn't it? And like this one. Thank you. So we're going to now have, um, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to have some kids' worship. So if we all stand, um, Peter's going to leave it, lead us in um, some worship. Let's say, let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you that you are the hope of the, of the nations. We thank you that we can look to you no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter where we've come from, no matter what fears we may have, we can look to you and know that you are our hope, our salvation, and in you we find fullness of life. And so we come today to worship you and to seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen. So kids, do you want to come forward? Show us... We will trust, trust in God alone. We will stand, stand upon His word, and whatever comes our way, we are strong, we are brave. His truth, truth will be our guide through the day, and in the darkest night, our God will give us strength. We are strong, and we are brave, and we will stand together, stand forever. We will stand strong, standing up for God each day. We will stand strong. We will trust, trust in God alone. We will stand. Upon his word and whatever comes our way, we are strong and we are brave. His truth, truth will be our guide through the day, and in the darkest night, our God will give us strength. We are strong and we are brave, and we will stand together. Stand strong, standing 
again How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing Okay, so we've got Kids Church, the, um, the little ones are downstairs, and then the 6 to 11-year-olds are across the street at the school. Let's pray for our kids as, we, as they go. Lord, thank you so much for our young people. Thank you that at this age they're seeing what an amazing God you are, how great and big and incredible you are, and how great your love for them is. We just pray your blessing over them in Jesus' name. Um, we are now going to um, have a time of worship. Um, oh, sorry, we're having a short break. Let's have a short break. Grab a coffee, grab a croissant.
All right, now it's time for worship. Shall we um, come together? Okay, great. Would you like to stand if you're able? That'd be great. Jesus. To lift him high. Praise is rising. Eyes are Come have your way, 
come have your way among us. We welcome you here. We welcome you here. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. Welcome here, you're here with us, Emmanuel has come to us, you've come to us, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. God of my present, 
God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future. You write my story, you hold it all together. God of my prison, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. And I believe that I will see the goodness of sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone And fall a stand before the throne Christ alone Christ 
storm right now. Let's bring them before him. Risen Jesus, powerful Lord. He is Lord of all. We're going to keep singing that for a moment, but let's just bring our own prayers, our own hopes, our own fears. presence 
I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world us in our need, in our weakness, in our frailty, no one but you. And who alone is worthy of praise? Who alone is worthy of adoration? Who has come down and become like us, familiar with our weakness, our fear, our doubt, our insecurity? It is only Jesus. who has taken our humanity and brought it right into the heavenlies and is sitting right at the right hand of Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. It's only Jesus. It's the only name we can sing. It's the only name we know because it is Jesus that has saved us. It is by Jesus' blood that we are saved. And it is through Jesus that we connect with the Father by His Spirit. It is through the precious name of Jesus that we find our salvation, our hope, our healing, our joy, our reason. Jesus, Jesus, no sweeter name. sweet a name no sweet a name Sing, no other 
the name Jesus, Jesus. There truly is no other name no name that is greater, no name that is higher. And as we look into a world that has so much hopelessness, as we look into a world where just this week, 27 lives were lost, precious, precious lives, children of God were lost in the channel. Where we look this week at the spread of the new variant of COVID and, and the impact this has on societies and individuals. We know that only the name of Jesus is above all these things. And so I want to, if you are a member of this church and you want to bring something that's weighing heavy, something that feels hopeless in the world, if you want to bring it up and pray, I put the mic here. We'll take a few moments to pray for the things that are going on in our world. You might want to sit or you can stay standing. Father, if we're honest, um, there's a lot of pain and a lot of fear and a lot of exhaustion in the UK. And I just want to bring that to you. I want to thank you for the, the praise and declaration that Pete's led us in. Father, I want to thank you that there is no other name but Jesus. And we just want to raise your name above um, Omicron, above COVID. Lord, we want to raise your name up above humanitarian crises above all the pain that uh, displaced families are feeling. I want to raise your name above all fear that we might have around our circumstances, our safety. And I specifically want to pray for the city of Liverpool that is grieving uh, the tragic loss of a, a young girl. And Lord, I thank you that you are the comforter. And I pray that you would be close to um, family and friends and everyone in that city who is grieving. Mm. We don't pretend to understand. We don't pretend to have the answers. But we do know that you are bigger than it all and that you are able to bring peace that passes all understanding you're able to bring healing you're able to surround us with love that you protect us you go before us and spirit of God that you are able to inspire and I ask father that um, we'd, f we'd be able to just give you our fears give you our pain give you our concerns and that we would find um that you are able to come in and bring your love, bring your peace and enable us to um, share that with those who are around us.
Amen. Well, it comes to that exciting time of the Sunday notices. So firstly, for those of you who um, are not too sure about the best way to stay in touch with the things that are happening at St. Mary's, it is, of course, social media, that beast. Um, so like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram um, using St. Mary's London. Um, and of course, if you would like to give to the work of the church, there is a QR code um, up there, or if you're joining online, you can click on the button in the chat to give. Um, and there's also contactless giving at the back of the church. Um, and of course, this does apply to members, but I always say if you're visiting and you feel like giving, feel free. It's very welcome. Christmas! Woohoo! Yeah, Who, who's feeling Christmassy? Oh man, I need some of that to rub off on me. I am not, and my daughter is very annoyed with me. All right, so this year's family carol service is happening on Sunday, the 12th of December. It will feature a kids' nativity drama, carols, St. Mary's school choir, Christingle oranges, which you can't miss, mulled wine, also can't, can't miss, and mince pies. Um, these are great events to invite friends and family to, and um, it will be very busy, so you want to arrive earlier than usual. Um, and also, uh, just saying, I, I lived overseas for five years, and I missed a lot about St. Mary's, but the thing I missed most was the carol service. It, if you haven't been before, come. It is fantastic. The choir is amazing, the kids are amazing, the decor is amazing, it's just brilliant, don't miss it, invite people, because everybody can come to a carol service. It's good for everyone. Um, but we also need about 30 people to help make the morning and evening carol services run smoothly. There are going to be some clipboards that are going to go around. Um, it would be great if as many of us as possible can get involved, as well as we need people to help decorate the church. So it's quite a big endeavor. Um, we need to decorate the church, make Christingle um, oranges, steward and pack down. Um, and we also need some strong people to help Nicholas, because although he is very strong, he can't do it on his own um, during the setup of the church. Um, so if you can give some time during the week, week running up to the services, so from about the 8th to the 10th of December, please sign up on the clipboards that are going around now. Um, also, I'd like to say a huge thank you. We'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who gave or pledged money at um, the recent gift days. Every gift really does make an impact, so thank you so much. And I'm really glad to tell you that um, we have so far received £35,000, which is very encouraging. Wow! Which is very encouraging, um, especially at this time, uh, you know, these tricky times, and it will make a big impact on, on what we're doing. Um, we'd also like to invite the LGBTQ plus gathering um, is happening um, on the 1st of December. That's this Wednesday, 7 p.m. here. Um, so if you, um, if you are part of the LGBT plus community, we'd love to invite you. It's a chance to get to know each other and an opportunity to invite your friends also. Um, so please sign up at, online at stmaryslondon.com to let us know if you're coming. Um, so... For those of you who are aware or not aware, of course, every time I stand up, I am going to be talking about multiculturalism, even if I haven't been asked to. So, you know, we've got to do this thing. Um, we have just finished the first three weeks of the Mirrors course, which was downstairs. We had a great turnout. Thank you to all of you who came. Um, and I'd love to, I obviously was involved in part of the leading, um, but I'd love you to hear from people who were participating who are, attend who are attending. So if you are here and you'd like to tell us a little bit about your experience, now is your time. Please, do come up. Stephanie. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, so I attended the Mirrors course because I have had a lot of um, suppressed pain that I needed a space to be able to um, speak about them and so on the course not only were we um, delighted with um, foods from uh, Ethiopia and Ghana and Israel, and Israel which was really really fantastic 
but we were also given um, some um, talks about um, multiculturalism and the British Empire and also how the um, events of the past can impact you and how we have carried these over into our lives. Um, and you go through life with a lot of questions and pain and with no um, platform to air them. And that was what the um, course really offered. There was no shame, there was no name um, um, game, there was just a space to learn more about um, history and, and the impact thereof. So um, 30 years ago, I experienced racism in um, the workplace, and for six months, I endured that. I became invisible because um, I was signaled out. I wasn't um, included in any of the normal of, uh, of his activities, and so I became invisible. Um, when you grew up in a, in a culture that um, children are seen and not heard, you become muted. So most of my life I've lived muted and invisible person. And all the pain of racism, because I didn't have a platform to talk about them, they became suppressed and they became invisible and they became hidden. So I see myself as an iceberg. I, th I show one third of me and the two thirds are the pain that are really deeply rooted. And on week two, the question was asked, who am I and where do you stand? And I couldn't answer the question, who am I? Because for most of my life, I've lived a life of mute and invisible. And that has carried over in my, my life. Sometimes I come to St. Mary's and I feel like I'm invisible because people look at me and look past me. And all of that pain, you know, you carry it without any platform, any way to talk about it, because you start to talk about racism and it's like nobody understands or you're too sensitive. But it's, it's not that. It's like you have so much pain that is really, 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 really deep deep-rooted, and I've also discovered that the pain is not just my own pain, but the pain of generation. So I thank you for the opportunity and the space to start to lift the lid, all of the lid from all of this pain that has been suppressed and suppressed and suppressed. And also the time of prayer was very uh, powerful as well. So I'm now not going to live my life a mute or invisible because that is not what God has designed for me because I felt that I really um, have not lived my life to the full extent of what God really has planned for me because of hiding and I'm going through a lot of a healing process and it's time that I really start to live my life um, in a freedom. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Amen, thank you. Um, is there anybody else who wants to say anything who was there?
Okay. Uh, my name is Gervais. I attended the um, multiculturalism talk hosted by the wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I loved it um, mainly because it helped me feel accepted in the church where um, I'm just growing up in. Um, seeing the response, by, seeing the turnout, first of all, um, everyone is feeling open, um, everyone is willing to learn, and for us to come together as a community, um, regardless of, you know, all the different social stratifications and divisions, for us to come together, um, educate ourselves, communicate, you know, grow and learn together, hearing experiences, um, and really reflecting upon them on how to improve as a church. I think it really gave me encouragement and it really felt, made me feel like this is a place where I want to be. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you, you Jovez. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, that's made me a bit emotional. Watch out, world. Jovez and Stephanie are coming out. Um, as with everybody else. <laughs> um, all right, well, the wonderful Matt is going to speak to us today, carrying on the second part of Philemon, I think. I might be making that up. We're about to find out. Morning, everyone. I stood in the wrong place last week, and the live stream sort of caught like the back of my head the whole way through. Anyway, I got told off by Nicholas, so I'm now standing <laughs> so far away from all of you. Anyway, not forever. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to St. Mary's. Um, if we haven't met before, my name's Matt. I'm one of the leaders um, here. And this is, as Eileen said correctly, the second of two talks on Paul's letter uh, to Philemon, which is a letter in the New Testament. Um, if you missed the first, um, do go and check it out. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, but if you missed out, um, let me give you a very quick recap of what I spoke about um, last week. So I introduced Paul's letter to Philemon. Um, it's a very short letter, about 355 words in the Greek, one page in your Bibles today. But despite its size, it's extremely important um, to us because it shows Paul fleshing out his theology. It shows Paul practically showing his understanding of what he thinks the gospel is, how the gospel works out in community in the context of the church. And so in the letter, Paul is writing to ask Philemon to forgive and reconcile Onesimus, who probably stole something from him. Fantastic. Paul has an opportunity to show the theology of reconciliation, how it works in the church. At the cross, God in Christ has reconciled us to himself, no longer counting our sins against us. There's no separation between us and God. And having been forgiven at great cost, the Lord gives us peace. And from that peace, we can then go on and to share reconciliation for those who are um, out of relationship with us. Perfect. Brilliant. Fantastic. However, there is the added moral challenge, I should say, for us, not for the first listeners to this letter, because in this scenario, Anisimus is Philemon's slave. And I spoke briefly about this last week. You can catch up on the, part, on the last podcast. I spoke about slavery in the Roman Empire. It wasn't based on race, but on class, social status, and honor. Nevertheless, I wanted us to be clear, slavery was not a good thing back then either. Those who were slaves lived awful lives, particularly those uh, with bad slave masters. And Paul wants Philemon not to exercise his rightful um, power as master over Philemon or to pursue justice, but to create a cycle of grace and restoration and forgiveness and reconciliation. But Paul is asking that Philemon do even more than just forgive Anismus. Because as Anismus has come to Paul and he's been converted and become a follower of Jesus as well, Paul now wants Philemon to welcome Anismus back as a brother. And so here we have another strand of Paul's theology being worked out, and that is his theology of what the church is. Paul wants to create a whole new society right in the middle of the Roman Empire, a fellowship of equals in which slave owner and slave are brothers and sisters and siblings on the basis of their adoption as children of God. 
He sought to embody a whole new vision for humanity, and it's called the church, where people of the church conduct themselves and relate to one another in the light of new kingdom realities that have been made possible by Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, I got a lot of um, the content for last week's talk and this talk from a theologian called Scott McKnight. I recommend him to you using his commentaries and a couple of lectures. And this talk um, really is based on one of the lectures I saw him give. And he started this lecture with an analogy. And he says, there are three ways to make a salad. There is the weird way. There is the wrong way. And there is the right way. The weird way is to separate each item in your salad and to have them in little pots scattered around the table like tapas. The wrong way is to fill your bowl with some iceberg lettuce, some spinach leaves, some tomatoes, some slices, um, olives, some shredded carrots, anything that you like, and then you smother it in salad dressing. And the right way to make a salad, I'm going to come back to in a few moments. Now, as I said um, last week, um, Paul probably wrote this letter at the same time as writing his letter to the Colossians. And I believe that they were sent together um, to Colossae, uh, where Philemon lived and where he led his house church. Now, in the first century, there was no royal mail. Um, If you wanted to have a letter sent, you had to find somebody who would send it for you. Letters were transported personally from sender to recipient. Physical letter may be written on papyrus, folded, a brief address on the front cover had to be carried, whether it's to the next village one mile down the road or to another country where you, wherever the recipient might be. And so once a letter had been written, that generally meant finding someone who's going to go in the right direction, who you trusted, who then might some, find someone else who's going in the right direction, who take it the rest of the way, unless you had the resources or were connected enough to get it into the imperial um, um, post or wealthy enough to have a slave carry it for you and deliver your mail. And I should say um, that letter writing uh, was very popular in the ancient world. We are fortunate to have thousands and thousands of letters uh, from ancient Egypt, 7,000 Greek letters written on papyrus, more than 1,000 letters in the Roman times, and several thousand letters written by church leaders during the uh, 2nd to 5th centuries, Uh, not to mention, of course, the New Testament letters that we're familiar with. Letter writing and their distribution were a massive deal. And trustworthy couriers were sought after and celebrated, and untrustworthy couriers were a cause for breakdown in communication and blamed for a lot of the issues that were going on. So even 2,000 years ago, you have your DPD and you've got your Hermes going on at the moment. This means um, of delivery, um, there are consequences for how a letter might be written. You didn't simply get to the end of your letter letter and think, oh, goodness, where did I put the stamps? No, but actually the presence of a courier would impact how you would write this letter to the people who you were writing it to. Because delivering the letter didn't necessarily mean simply handing the papyrus over to the recipient, but it meant reading the content, adding to the content, emphasizing uh, with words which weren't necessarily in there, additional word of mouth information from the writer to the recipient. This is what Paul says at the end of his letter to Colossians. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus. You may have heard of him. Our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything that's happening here. And so it's thought by some scholars that Paul had Tychicus courier both letter to the Colossians and to Philemon to the churches in Colossae and then deliver the mail and then deliver the message that is in the mail. And so once the letters were written, I believe that Paul would have taught Tychicus how he was supposed to read this letter. He would have said, this is the tone that you need in this part. This is the expression you should give when you're reading this bit. This is the bit where you need to be staring Philemon in the eyes. Because if you're not looking at him right now, this letter's not going to make much sense. This is the bit which needs emphasis. Pause for effect here. Do not let him off the hook. And so what I want to do is, as we um, think about this letter, I want us to think about it more than just a book in the Bible, more than the thing that we sort of see as one page in the 3,000 words that are already there, more than just that. But this was once a letter, and when it was first sent, when it was first delivered, only three people knew the contents, Paul, Onesimus, and Tychicus. And Philemon is utterly in the dark about what is about to happen as this letter is read to him. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And the people in the church wouldn't have known as well. They're all sitting going, oh goodness, we've got a letter from the Apostle Paul. How lovely. Let's hear what it's got to say. And so what I want you to do is I want you to imagine yourself in Philemon's house. You already know some of the backstory. 
But you imagine that Tychicus has arrived. and He's standing there face to face and he's about to read his letter. Remember, see yourself as maybe one of the um, people in the congregation who are sat there, people in the church and the household. They would have participated in the reading. They're just going, oh, goodness, I wasn't expecting that. A little bit of shock and awe. They would have been reacting in real time as Tychicus read it out, engaging with what they're hearing. And, of course, there would have been all the different groups of people who were there listening to this letter being read out. There would have been slaves whose lives were literally hanging in the balance on Philemon's decision about Anismus. They would have been implicated in in Anismus running off. Philemon would perhaps assume that they knew what was about to happen. And so the slaves would listen to this letter being read in a particular way. There may have been family members of Philemon or other neighboring houses. There would have been other believers who had joined them. There may be homeless people who had been part of the church and were, were knitted in to the family of God and connected to them. And of course... The elephant in the room is that Anisimus was there. He's come back and he's standing in the room waiting Philemon's judgment. And so as I read this letter, I want you to imagine this tense, confused scene as three people know what's going on and the rest of the people are only find out later. Paul doesn't start this letter with his ask, but he takes a while to get there. He loads the basis. He adds layer upon layer upon layer of persuasion to Philemon, increasing that tension for Philemon, who probably knows something's about to happen soon. I'm about to get the ask. So let's look at this letter. The words should appear on the screen. I'm going to sort of go verse by verse, add a few little bits of um, uh, layers of information for you. First one, Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm going to stop there. Okay, very quickly, I'm going to stop there. This is the only time that Paul opens a letter calling himself a prisoner for Christ. He writes lots of prisoners, prison letters, but this is the first and only time he does it. Why? Because we know things that Philemon doesn't. We know that Paul knows things and Anismus things and Tychus knows things, but Philemon is in the dark. Paul is using rhetoric to identify himself with Anismus, to put him on the side with the slave. Paul and a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Paul begins by thanking and honoring Philemon in front of the congregation. So imagine Tychicus, he's there reading this letter, and he's sort of eyeballing Philemon, and he's looking at the congregation, going back and forth, everyone's gathered, and you just know Philemon's loving this. He's loving this. His leadership is being strengthened, he's having his ego stroked by the Apostle Paul. But what Paul is doing here... And I'm sure Paul believes everything he's saying, but I think he's also honoring Philemon as a Christian because eventually he's going to try and motivate Philemon as a Christian as well. Verse 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Do you hear that? Love for all his people, including Anisimus, including people who might not be acceptable, even slaves, even slaves who'd run away. He's giving his theology a boost, saying, this is the type of Christian I know you are, Philemon. Verse 6, I pray that your partnership, koinonia, it's that word from last week, uh, with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Paul's making a request there without making it clear. He's loading it theologically. Philemon doesn't know what's going on, but Onesimus, Paul, and Tychus do. Verse 7. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Paul's saying you're going to have an opportunity to do a little bit more refreshing today. Verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. So having just said that you love all the saints, he's asking him to return to this disposition. And then what he does, he sort of backs off a bit. He goes, it's none other than I, Paul, an old man now, an old, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. In other words, feel sorry for me, little old me, little old pit prisoner Paul, that I appeal to you for my son, Anisimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful to both you and me. Paul is saying, Anisimus and I, we're now family. We're now, uh, we're now family in Jesus. He's served me faithfully. And even though I'd quite like to keep him, I know there's unresolved conflict between you. And as Christians, that cannot go on. Verse 12, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I'd have liked to keep him with me so that I could take, uh, so he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. 
but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you, would, uh, you do would not be seen forced, but be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while is that you might have him back forever. And this is it. This is where Paul now declares the status of Onesimus in the household of Philemon. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Philemon, you know you love all God's people. Here's another one for you to love. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and now as a brother in the Lord. And this is where we finally reach the ask, 17 verses into this, this short letter. And so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And I think this is where Tychicus is absolutely eyeballing Philemon. He's not letting him off the hook. He's going right down. He's saying, if you want to welcome, if you would welcome Paul, you have to welcome Onesimus in exactly the same way. Paul has put him at exactly the same level as him. Verse 18. If he's done anything wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Spoke about this last week, the heart of Paul's theology of reconciliation. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. But just to be clear, this is what's called laying it on thick, okay? It probably means that he owes his conversion to it, probably through Epaphras. Verse 20. I do not wish, brother, that I may have some ben- I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. In other words, you've refreshed all those other people. Now's your chance to refresh me. Verse 21, confident of your obedience. And I think this does sound a little bit like Paul suddenly sort of switched and using his power as the apostle over. I actually think what he's doing here is he's using the authority of the gospel to motivate Philem. That actually your obedience to the gospel, which is so central to your household, I'm reminding you of your obedience to that and to the Lord Jesus Christ. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. In other words, you're praying for me to be released from prison. Well, when I get out, I'm going to come and see how it's going between you and Anisimus. <laughs> he then addresses a few others in the church. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, uh, be with your spirit. And that's the whole letter. It's the whole thing. It's everything he writes him. This is a story of a house being rearranged by reconciliation. And we looked last week uh, specifically about reconciliation. And what I want to do today is look about look at the house being re- uh, rearranged around reconciliation. So Paul um, has this vision uh, for the church. He's got this vision for sibling-based fellowship on the basis of adoption as children of God. And so for Paul, this social revolution, it was intended to happen within the church, in the body of Christ, in small households dotted around the Mediterranean. And in Onesimus, the slave who meets him and is eventually converted while he's in prison, I think Paul meets a challenge to his theology. He realizes, I've got a slave master and a slave. This is a challenge, but also an opportunity to see my theology practically worked out in the life of this community. And for Paul, Jesus' death and resurrection achieved unthinkable things for the Roman and Jewish society that emphasized hierarchy and status and position. Instead, to respond to Jesus Christ is to recognize and acknowledge that all God's people are equal partners who share in the gift of the love and the grace of God. And so all those who are in Christ are equally children of God. Siblings, doesn't matter on your background. This is the new theological reality. This is how Jesus sees things and Paul longs for churches to get with the program. This thing has happened in Christ. You are in Christ. Could you please begin relating to one another in your churches as though this thing is actually happening? Get with the program. And so Paul, we see in his letters, is often trying to break down social barriers of division that come between people and establish the reality of what's happened in the new creation. So the letters of Romans and Galatians, he's primarily breaking down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles, ethnic barriers. In Philemon, he's breaking down the barriers between slave and free, social economic boundaries. Paul says in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. Neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Let's just break that down. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. 
There's no ethnic divisions between you. There's neither slave nor free. There's no social or socio-economic class divisions between you. There's neither male nor female. There's no gender. The genders are not pitted against one another. Why is there no order of life um, on the basis of ethnicity, class, or gender? It's because you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ is the important theological term for Paul. It's the idea that when we are included in Jesus' death and resurrection, what is true for Jesus becomes true of us as well. Paul's vision is that we, the church, would be one. So people's value, people's status are not defined by social class or race or wealth. All there is is new humans a new humanity who are joined together through God in Jesus' death and resurrection. And this is why the early church was so radical. This is why the earliest churches were made up of folk from all over the social map. Churches were made up of a mixture of people from different places on the map and the spectrum. Men, women, rich, poor, a mix of races and ethnicities, free and slave. And what this did is it confronted the Roman society that they were living in. Suddenly, suddenly, all the people who were invisible were made visible. All the people who were pushed to the side and not seen in wider society were brought into the middle. They were seen, they were known, they were honoured, they were loved, they were cared for as siblings in the life of the church. Scott McKnight says this, The church is God's world-changing social experiment of bringing unlikes and difference to the table to share life with one another as a new kind of family. When this happens, we show the world what love, justice, peace, reconciliation, and life together are designed by God to be. The church is God's show and tell for the world to see how God wants us to live as family. And this is a lovely idea, isn't it? It's lovely until you have to work out how to do it in practice, isn't it, right? And you know that this has never been easy, don't you? I mean, you just saw how thickly Paul had to lay that on Philemon to try and get what he wanted. He knew that this was going to be a challenge. He knew that Philemon would need to lay down his sense of status, his sense of superiority, his pride, his privilege to welcome Onesimus as a brother. And can we just acknowledge just how revolutionary this letter is for a moment? Of the thousands of letters that were sent uh, during uh, that time and before, How many of them, in a shame, honor society with clear hierarchical boundaries between people, how many were written encouraging a slave master to consider his slave as his brother? I bet it's just this one. This is radical stuff that is happening. It's challenging stuff. It's unheard of. It's never been considered before. This is completely alien to the Roman and Jewish cultures of the time. Paul knew that it was going to be hard. It's hard in every generation. Some of you in this very room are pushing for equality, equity, and justice, and it feels like your request is hitting the ears for people for the first time as well. It's hard. So what does this mean in our community to believe this? Well, let's go back to our salad. There are three ways to make a salad. There's the weird way where all the different elements are in separate bowls. There's the wrong way, where all the ingredients are in the same bowl, smothered in salad dressing so you can't taste the individual ingredients. And then there is the right way. The right way to make a salad and to eat a salad is to gather all of your ingredients, some spinach, some kale, rainbow chard, chop them into smaller bits, tomatoes, carrots, red onions, red pepper, purple cabbage, nuts, dried berries, create some pecorano romano cheese, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, mix them all together and then drizzle with extra virgin olive oil, the good stuff from Waitrose. (laughs) And somehow it just brings all the flavors and you can taste them all to their fullest. The oil is the Holy Spirit, and he mixes all the different elements, and you get to taste them all. Sometimes in the church, we do weird salad, where all the different elements are in separate bowls. We sit in our areas, we hang out with our people who are just like us. And Sunday morning becomes an exercise of cultural and spiritual segregation. And I'm absolutely certain that if Paul was writing a letter to us, us, the church, the big C church with little C, I'm sure he would say this is hugely detrimental 
as a hugely detrimental um, to the Christian life itself. Instead of powering God's grand social experiment, what we've done is we've cut up God's plan into segregated groups in such a way that most of us are invisible to one another. God designed the church to make the previously invisible visible to God and to one another in a whole new kind of fellowship. But we've made it so that we don't see anyone apart from the people who are just like us, and it's tragic. Sometimes at church, we do salad the wrong way, where we have all the elements together, but we cover it in white dressing, and none of the elements can be tasted. There's this culture in the church, and anyone else with their background and culture is just smothered until they become invisible. They feel ignored and eventually go AWOL. And as you know, this has been the very sad reality for many people stepping into this particular church as well. Some black people have told us that entering St. Mary's feels like entering a white space. And so we, with the help of Eileen and her team on Jigsaw, they're helping us address this. This is not just an initiative. It's not just a project. It's not just a thing that we're trying for a bit. This is vital gospel work. It's taking place in our midst, and we cannot neglect it. We are diminished spiritually and missionally if we do not take this seriously together. And it's so great, so great to hear those testimonies about mirrors. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who's going to share those stories. We'll hear more of those tonight as well. Thank you to every single person who went to the last three weeks on Wednesday nights to engage, to meet and sit with people on long tables, eating different foods with people who you might not necessarily engage with. Let's see that nobody is invisible in our church community. I believe that the success of the church should be determined by how many invisible people become visible to those who are not like them. Because, of course, we are supposed to do church and salad the right way. We should taste the spinach and the kale and the tomato and the cucumber and the chard because their taste is heightened by the olive oil. The gift of the Holy Spirit softens the friction between the elements of the salad and we become whole together in unity as we are made it to be one family. And of course, if the church is a mixed salad done the right way, then we should see lots of difference emerge. We should see lots of invisibles suddenly become visible. Our church services and the people who we encounter on Sunday mornings, we should see different races and cultures and ages and social economic classes and genders and sexualities. People with varied educations, incomes, jobs, family backgrounds, marital statuses, introverts, extroverts, the neurodiverse, the able-bodied and the disabled. People with preferences in music and art and worship style and people who like long sermons and people who like short sermons. People who've got gifts for these things and gifts for those things, skills and abilities. All in the bowl. All thrashing it out together. Because this is what church is about. This is what the Christian life um, is about. It's about learning to love one another by the power of God's grace so that we can flourish as God's people in the world. Even more than that, If the church is a mixed salad bowl, then we need to understand church differently. We should end up understanding church as true fellowship. We should see it as life together with one another, going the long term with one another. I'm going to stick with these people through whatever. We should understand the church as as transcending difference and honoring difference. We should see it as enjoying difference and we should see it as love and justice and reconciliation between all people. And it's my belief, Peter and the band, you want to come up? And it's my belief that Philemon did, in fact, reconcile with Anismus. I think that the very reason that we have this letter, that it survived the ages and it ended up in the scripture, is because reconciliation allowed for the furniture in this household to be moved around, that barriers and preferences and hierarchies were indeed broken down, and that they were truly able to see one another for who they truly are in Christ as children of God and as siblings. Amen. Okay, let's stand. Let's stand, we'll worship, and then we'll pray for people. Um, Classically, we are singing to God, and I've chosen a song now where we're going to sing to each other. Um, It's The Blessing. You may have come across it last year, and um, perhaps rather than just getting into our little closed worship space with our eyes closed, just between us and Jesus, Maybe we can look around. 
and acknowledge that we're all here. And let's sing some blessing over each other. My fault. gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing that again. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you, 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 he is for you. 
The Lord bless you. Let's, um, let's open our hands, a sign of being open to God. Having blessed one another, let's receive the Lord's blessing now as well. It's the Holy Spirit who brings unity. It's the Holy Spirit who reduces the friction between the difference. And so receive the Holy Spirit again. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So I think it would be good um, to pray for a couple of groups of people. Um, first of all, and most obviously, and most importantly, anybody who has felt invisible coming to church. Could be for race, could be for any other reason. But come and receive the blessing of God and know that you are loved and known and cared for and cherished. Receive his grace and his welcome and inclusion again. And I think also this is an opportunity for us to repent. And for those of us where we have fallen into the pattern of repeatedly coming to church and sitting with our people and speaking to our people, to come forward and say, actually, this is a fresh start. And that stepping forward is like, it's, it's a physical movement. It's saying, actually, Lord, I'm making this move and I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm going to start again. And that's how it is. We're always welcomed with grace. There's no shame. There's no condemnation. But the invitation is to come and to start again. And so if anybody um, would like prayer and for the people of God to come and pray God's blessing on you for those reasons, then come to the front now. Come forward. And ministry team, if you can come forward too. Well done. So those of you who come forward, hold your hands open as a sign of being open to God. And come with words and speak to Jesus, who is kind, who knows you and loves you. And say, this is what I'm coming forward for. And so I add my prayers to yours. Lord, would you bless them. Fill them with your love. Bless them. Okay, ministry team of two, can you begin moving around? A few more people to come and pray for them. I'm going to call a formal close to our service. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest on you and all who you love this day and evermore. Amen. Please don't forget to collect your kids. Remember, some of them are now over at the school, the older ones, otherwise they're downstairs. Don't rush away, grab a drink, say hello to somebody brand new, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 
To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain In the evening, in your coming and your going In your weeping and rejoicing He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you he is for you, he is for you, he is for you, he is for you. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. So break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. He is for you, 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 he is for you. Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 